You're listening to Faith in 20, an out-of-the-box, grace-based ministry rooted in the great news of Jesus Christ. As with all God's children, I'm a competent minister of a new covenant, taught all things by the Holy Spirit. Have a question or two? Sick of the modern church model or just looking for context on scripture? Then I've got you covered, so stick around. Hey guys, a very warm welcome back to the show. We are already seven episodes down in our series on the Divine Council, including our rabbit trails into the Divine Rebellions. Now, I hope that this is starting to form a more complete picture for you and is even starting to shatter some of that poor muscle memory that came from a reformatory interpretation of the ancient texts. As far as we've come, I have so much more to discuss with you. Now, you may have noticed that the Divine Council isn't just an add-on to your biblical knowledge. It's a way of stepping back and truly being open to examining things as they're dictated by the text, not by how you may have heard them in the past. Now, in the last episode, we examined the divine power that is captured inside of the name Hashem and why this made the Tower of Babel event so monumental in shaping Israel as a nation. We looked at the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, which involved Yahweh dividing the nations and fixing the borders post-Babel, at which point he placed the sons of God, or the lesser created Elohim, in charge of these nations, while he sought to start a new race for himself beginning in Genesis chapter 12 with little old Abram. We have no Jew or Gentile prior to Genesis 12 because, obviously, the new race started with Abraham. We looked at the hierarchy of Elohim, including the differences between the divine messengers, or the Malachim, the sons of God, who became the rebellious Elohim, demons in the way an ancient Israelite thought of them, and also how Paul references them back in the book of Romans, hearkening back to Deuteronomy 32.17, which is that they were and remain to be the bastard spirits of the partially divine offspring, Nephilim, who were produced from the unions between the sons of God and the daughters of mankind. Okay, today we're going to look at this whole idea of cosmic geography, which finds its roots from the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. This is essentially the idea that whatever territory belonged to Yahweh was considered holy and any territory belonging to any other God was considered unholy. Now, if you've been following the show for a while, you may already be familiar with the idea that Yahweh made very clear to his people what was considered holy and what wasn't. He essentially trained them to know what was out of bounds. So there wouldn't be any confusion. Now, we see evidence of this quote-unquote training when Yahweh brings forth the law. In Deuteronomy 17.2, just prior to the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, God warns his people against worshiping other gods, bowing down to them or the moon or the stars in the sky. Now, keep in mind that God is not a nonsensical God. He doesn't give commands for things that aren't possible. He commanded his people against sorcery and divination because it is possible to communicate with the other realm, with dangerous beings you know nothing about who have been around a heck of a lot longer than you have, just like it was possible to stray from Yahweh and worship another god. Now, we have a bit of knowledge about the Mesopotamian viewpoint when it came to celestial beings, so we understand that God gave this command because the ancients believed that the celestial beings were divine, and of course, this language is reflected in the text. Now, as I mentioned in a previous episode about the bodily resurrection, this language is used to describe what our bodies will be like. We have a direct correlation between the Abrahamic covenant and Paul's description of the bodily resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. Abraham's children would be like the stars or starry hosts, not only in quantity, but in quality as well. Fast forward to 2 Kings chapter 21, subsequent to the law being given, of course, this is just one example, but we see King Manasseh doing evil in the eyes of the Lord by bowing down and worshiping starry hosts, which are the same starry hosts spoken of in Deuteronomy 17 too. Now, 
Back to this idea of training people to understand what was holy. On the flip side of that, we see the Gentiles with an understanding of what was considered Yahweh's holy ground and what wasn't. For example, in the story of Naaman the leper, which we have examined more than a few times already on the show, he asked Elisha the prophet if he could leave the holy land with dirt from, gro- from the ground in tow with him after being healed, because he knew that the physical dirt on Yahweh's territory was holy, and where he was returning was not. So again, for clarification, everything is done under the supreme authority of Yahweh, who is the Most High, or Elion, as Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 puts it. So it's not that these gods were taking something from Yahweh. He allotted these territories and nations to these gods to rule over on his behalf for a time, seeing as how the nations clearly did not want to be under Yahweh's direct rule. Now, in Psalm 82, we see that these Elohim became corrupt, although we aren't told specifically why, although we do know that the descendants of the Nephilim occupied space in those nations, as we see from the battle under Joshua. But for whatever the reason may be, we see evidence that this Elohim were not fit according to Yahweh's standards. We see that in Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20, 17, verse 3, 29 verse 25 and 32 verse 17. Okay, so how do we see this idea of cosmic geography play out aside from Naaman, who we are all very well versed in by this point, and the general idea of Yahweh training his people to understand what was holy and what wasn't? Well, how about 1 Samuel chapter 26 verses 16 to 19? Here we see David on the run from a psychotic King Saul. In this event, David is driven away from the Holy Land, or Yahweh's inheritance, as it were, to use the Deuteronomy 32 language, where he knows he will not be able to worship Yahweh properly, since he's on the ground of a nation allotted to a different God. Verses 17 to 19 read, Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, O Lord My Lord, O King. And he said, What does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now therefore, let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So David is not unaware of the fact that all the earth belongs to Yahweh. However, he understands this inheritance peace. David's concerned that if pushed outside of Yahweh's portion, he would not be able to properly worship Yahweh. Now, we don't see David complaining about not being able to worship Yahweh when he's removed from the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Samuel 7-2 or even from the tabernacle in 1 Samuel 21-22. David's concern has to do specifically with the inheritance of Yahweh. David had his theology right, and he understood the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Now, another example of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, say that 10 times fast, perspective coupled with our newfound idea of spiritual warfare is found in Daniel 10. So here, Daniel has a vision where he sees someone in the likeness of man, with clearly divine features, perhaps we're looking at the embodied Yahweh or the second power in heaven, as it were. That's one for the students who've been listening. (laughs) Chapter 10, verse 6 reads, His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. So this language of shininess or luminescence, this harkens back yet again to our discussion on what the ancient Near East believed about divine beings as celestial bodies. Things that were shiny or luminary represented a divine being. Check the intro episode for the Divine Rebellion if you need a refresher on this. But let's continue on to Daniel chapter 10 verses 12 to 14. 
Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. And then at the outro of this interaction, verses 20 to 21 reads, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So as I read these passages, keep in mind the list of words that Paul uses throughout the New Testament to label such divine powers of darkness. Rulers, principalities, powers, authorities, dominions, lords, thrones, world rulers. It helps to keep these in your arsenal when you're reading back into the Old Testament. So the princes referred to in Daniel 10 are divine beings, not humans. We're comfortable enough now with this language and how the ancients perceived divine beings that we can confidently take on this mindset in Daniel's vision. We also know this because Michael, whom we know is a divine being in Daniel 10.13 and 10.21, is referred to as a prince in Daniel 12.1. So essentially the concept of Daniel 10 is based on the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Now, the prince of the kingdom of Persia is speaking about the patron, a patron angel of Persia. The concept of God disinheriting the nations and allotting them to different gods, breaking up the sons of God, was widely understood in the ancient Near East. The stuff that was born from the ancient Near East idea of the divine council. So for an in-depth look at some of this language around Paul's use of vocabulary for the powers of darkness, uh, Ron Johnson, who is one of my personal favorite scholars, wrote a PhD dissertation for the University of Dallas back in 04. You may find fascinating. It's titled The Old Testament Background for Paul's Principalities and Powers. Okay, this passage in Daniel coupled with the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, undoubtedly played a role in Paul's ideas about the unseen world. Now let's take a peek at Acts chapter 17, verses 26 to 27. This is Paul's speech at the Areopagus, where he is speaking about God's plan of salvation. Now that we see things from a divine counsel perspective, his, his words might sound a bit different than they have been to you in the past. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. So here we see a few things being alluded to. The initial judgment at Babel... And we're in Acts 17 now, so keep in mind we're past the day of Pentecost, where we see the inception of the re-inheriting of the nations. We have the immediate disinheriting of the nations post-Babel, Yahweh allotting a portion for himself in Deuteronomy 32.9, the covenant relationship with Abraham in Genesis 12, where the Jews would become the conduit for the seed that would bring salvation to all nations, not only the physical descendants of Abraham. Check out Galatians 3, 26 to 29 for that. Paul understood Yahweh's plan very well, and that the purpose of his ministry was in direct alignment with Yahweh's plan toward Edenic restoration. Speaking of the different vocabulary Paul uses to describe the powers of darkness, we see a reflection of the Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 terminology. So back in Daniel 10, the Hebrew word used for prince is sar. In 1013, when Michael is referred to as one of the chief princes, the Septuagint, again, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the word archomton. In older versions of the Septuagint, the prince of Persia and Michael are both referred to as the Greek word archon. 
This is the language Paul borrows when he speaks about the rulers of this age. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6, and 8, the rulers, quote, in heavenly places, Ephesians 3.10, and the ruler of the authority of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. So an argument can be made that the terms principalities, powers, authorities, dominions, lords, and thrones were used to describe humans. Now, I don't object to this by any means. However, we have clear evidence that Paul is also using these terms to describe divine beings and, on a larger scale, geographical domain rulership. For instance, we see principalities, authorities, and powers used in Ephesians 6.12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. How about Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, when Paul uses this language in reference to Jesus, that when God raised Jesus from the dead, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. As Ephesians 3.10 tells us, it was not until Christ had been raised from the dead that God's plan was made known to these rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. These powers of darkness at odds with Yahweh in this whole cosmic geographical turf war are precisely the rulers and authorities disarmed and put to shame at the cross, as we see in Colossians 2.15. So, simply put, these lesser gods were not okay with surrendering the turf they had been allotted back to Yahweh. Although, Yahweh always has the final say. The hostility of these rulers runs deep nonetheless. That goes without saying. You may recall we discussed briefly about the need for Christ to be, you know, kind of cryptic during his ministry as he was constantly under the scope of curious ears, so much so that the main adversary interrogated Jesus and even offered to hand over his own turf if Jesus would tell him why he came to earth. Speaking of which, God willing, there is much we will get into in the future with regards to the powers of darkness being disarmed. There is some really fascinating crossover with the book of Revelation in terms of Christ descending into the abyss, abyss and proving these powers of darkness wrong before ascending and taking the keys to the kingdom of heaven and Hades. But more on that in future episodes. So one further point I want to make before we move forward is understanding the reality of these lesser gods and the hostility they had towards Yahweh. It brings the idea of apostate Israelites into much greater clarity. Have you ever read through the Old Testament and wondered why was it so darn easy for the Israelites to turn from Yahweh? Did they just seem that naive that they would turn from Yahweh and worship gods that didn't even exist? If that were the case, it doesn't really say much for Yahweh's supreme power and authority. If anything, the fact that these are real gods, albeit created gods, shows the magnitude of what we're talking about here. These gods were real options for the Israelites to stray from their creator. And like I mentioned earlier, God is not nonsensical. He gave commands based on things that were actually possible. So it's Yahweh versus lesser gods or sons of God, not Yahweh versus a piece of wood or a bronze statue. We tend to grow up in churches thinking of idolatry in this truncated way, but this only tells probably about 25% of the story. You need to join this up with the ancient open mouth ceremonies we've discussed in the past, as well as with the backdrop of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Now, as we push forward, I want to move on from Babel and focus our attention a bit more on, Gen on the Genesis 12 rescue plan, which is, of course, the Abrahamic covenant. So in typical Yahweh style, God uses chaos to fix chaos. God called a man, Abram, literally from a place of rebellion, Mesopotamia, and entered into a covenant with him. God, of course, made it possible for Abraham and his wife, Sarah, to conceive a child despite their elderly age, being Isaac, who would become the father of Jacob, whose name would be changed to Israel following a wrestling match with the embodied Yahweh later on. 
Most of us recall God's first contact with Abraham as being in Genesis 12 when Abraham was in a place north of Canaan called Haran. God's actual contact with Abraham was a bit sooner, though. So following the Babel event, the remainder of the chapter is consumed by the genealogy of Abraham leading back to Noah's son Shem. Now, as I've come to realize in my time in the Old Testament, genealogies usually contain more information than what we assume at first glance. In Genesis 11, 31 to 32, we see that Abraham's family took him and they set out from the Ur of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. This ends chapter 11 right before the call of Abram in Genesis 12. Now, if we flip over to Acts chapter 7, verses 2 to 4, we see that God actually contacted Abraham prior to Genesis 12. In his speech to the Sanhedrin, Stephen says, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After this, God sent him to live in the land where you are now living. So, Genesis 12 is actually the second meeting between Abraham and the embodied Yahweh. Embodied? Yes, he was embodied. In the first encounter, we see that Yahweh appeared to Abraham. This was a visual encounter. These two encounters hearken back to the Jewish Godhead or the two powers in heaven motif, where we see God manifesting himself in the likeness of a man prior to the incarnation of Jesus. And, of course, if you need a refresher, go back and check out my Two Powers in Heaven episode, as this concept of a corporeal manifestation of Yahweh was an accepted belief in the Jewish Bible until 100 AD. So this is pre-Council of Nicaea, pre-Trinitarian model stuff by at least 1,200 years. So the first encounter of Genesis 12 we're all familiar with. This is where the Abrahamic covenant is made. God promises to bless Abraham and make him the father of all nations. But further along in verses 6 to 7, we get another glimpse of this embodied Yahweh. Now this is three if you're counting. Verses 6 to 7 read, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Amorah. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, as we continue on in Genesis, once you understand this embodied motif, this pattern reveals itself more and more. I won't dig into this too much because I don't want to overlap too much with my previous episodes about the two powers in heaven and the angel of the Lord, which definitely both speak to this concept. But following Genesis 12, this puts us right into Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6, where the Abrahamic covenant is repeated and ratified. You'll notice in this passage, the description of the embodied Yahweh is even more developed. Now we see the word of Yahweh appearing to Abraham, speaking to him and even bringing him outside, where he speaks the famous line, Look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall be your offspring. Of course, we know this was both a quantitative and qualitative promise. It's interesting that the word of the Lord is immediately associated with a vision, a physical manifestation. Now, I'm not suggesting that every instance of the word is automatically coupled with a visual manifestation throughout scripture, but we do see confirmation of this when John begins to recycle this language in his book. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, followed by the word becoming flesh and dwelling or tabernacling among us. Now, why am I harping so much on this Abraham stuff since this is familiar to most people? Well, Genesis 12 is really where we start to see this two powers in heaven motif in full view. I've started diving more into the literature around this, and I cannot even begin to tell you how much doctrine has been born out of this idea of an invisible and an embodied Yahweh in terms of the early rabbinics. And most of it has to do with backpedaling away at any cost of thinking that the embodied Yahweh could be a pre-incarnation of the Messiah. Because, of course, that would mean for the Jews, if they had 
admitted this, that they would have to admit that they killed their Messiah. The rabbis had all sorts of ideas to make this not seem like the Messiah, even stating that the second power was Melchizedek, Elijah, Enoch, or even the mediator angel Metatron that Enoch transformed into when he ascended to heaven, according to the early Jewish mysticism. In John chapter 8, verse 58, we see Jesus really sticking it to the Pharisees here when he reminds them that it was him who appeared to Abraham prior to his incarnation. Abraham, your father, rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then Jesus whips out the famous line, before Abraham was, I am. Genesis 12 and 15 are the only possible backdrop for this. The interchange is flawless here. The word is associated with the Yahweh from Genesis, and now Jesus is saying, hey guys, that was me. Jesus could have said, I was, but he says, I am. Yahweh first announces himself as such in the burning bush from Exodus 3.14, which also involves a visible manifestation. So Jesus is associating himself with the name and with all of the things that happened in Genesis in terms of this angel of the Lord slash two powers motif. The idea that the Messiah was being touted as the embodied Yahweh was not a foreign concept to a Jew at that time. It was the fact that Jesus was the one associating himself with the embodied Yahweh. Remember, it wasn't until later that the two powers in heaven concept was refuted. As I said, it lends itself more to Christianity, which, hey guys, it's the new Judaism, is it not? <laughs> this word, the word monotheism that a modern Jew will use today to refute the idea that Jesus is God is not actually their theology. With all due respect, a Jew today doesn't even understand their own theology because it's been removed from the original text. Any inkling of a two powers in heaven motif has been struck from their material and left only for the eyes of a quote unquote sage or wise man. Monotheism wasn't even spoken of until the 17th century AD. An ancient Jew was very comfortable with the two powers concept. And you know who else knew this? Paul. Paul knew this too. This provides the backdrop for Galatians 3.8 when Paul says that the gospel that God would justify to the Gentile nations was preached to Abraham. Paul understood how the covenant was delivered to Abraham. Whew, okay guys, <laughs> we'll wrap it there for today. I know I went down a bit of a rabbit hole with the two powers, but man, it truly is the foundation for what we've established as our modern Trinitarian model. Now, I, for one, get sick of hearing churches speak the Trinity into the Old Testament, so it's time to get some clarity on this. And as we move forward, we'll get to know a bit about some of the other gods, who represented them in the flesh, and we might even get a little crazy and dive into some astral prophecy and how Yahweh used the cosmos to deliver messages to all his people. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening today. I really hope you're enjoying this series. If you want to reach out, you have any questions at all, you know where to find me. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next one. Bye now. for tuning in to this episode of Faith in 20. If you'd like to learn more about the ministry, reach out at faithin20 at gmail.com, on Twitter or on Instagram at faithin20.ministry.